Hi, everybody. Welcome to lesson number four. It's December 24th. Oh, Yay! Santa Claus is coming to town. Wait, wrong, wrong. Yeah. Well, Santa okay. Is. But you're talking about. I am talking about somebody this else. This is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Yes. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. It is a beautiful time of year. Thank you for sticking with us. There's going to be 25 people watching this video this week because yeah. half of y'all aren't going to Sunday school. So, it's true. Anyway. This is true. That's okay. We're going to enjoy the half of you that are joining us yes. this week. I am Becky Zardi. I'm the Director of Ministry of the Women for the Ministry Council of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. My name is Chris Fleming. I'm the Adult Ministries Coordinator for the Ministry Council of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, and I am glad that you are spending your holiday week with us. With us. Thank you for being here. Yes. This week we're looking at Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 42. Our memory verse comes from Matthew 12, 40. It says, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so for three days and three nights the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. And this lesson was written by Yanina Barrios um, down in Florida. Jacksonville. Yeah, Jacksonville, Florida. Thank you for writing for us this week, Yanina. That was awesome. Our prayer for illumination to get us going. Eternal Father, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to offer the perfect sacrifice required to forgive our sin now and forever. Help us to be your faithful children and more obedient to your will. We ask you to increase our faith. Give us courage to teach those who do not know you and your son's reconciling love. Thank you for loving us and forgiving our sins. Amen. 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 And she starts this week with a reflection question. Yes. Have you ever thought that Jesus' stay in the tomb was prophesied by Jonah's stay in the belly of the fish? fish. Hmm. Yes, because I'm a Bible college student. This that's is true. What I do. Okay. Now, not everybody would even know that. Right, that's true. Because not everybody has studied that far. Hence the next question. Yep. Which is why do you believe that God's children must have a deep understanding of their Hebrew roots to prove that the sign of Jonah was fulfilled and not simply believe without knowing? So, I guess I'll take a hit at this one. Please. Um, I think, um, I do think it's important um, because sometimes we separate who we are with the culture that we're in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I say that to say, when you're in vacation Bible school, mm -hmm. you most of us learned a song called Father Abraham had many Father sons. Abraham. Many I sons had so. Father Abraham. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yep. I'm one of them. Yep. So are you. So am I. And we're praising God for that. Amen. But the point being is, is that spiritually we are ancestors, we are Jews. Like uh, one of the things that Jews will say is, I am a Jew. Right. right, and they'll repeat this, and they'll repeat their heritage and all that jazz. And so, in the Book of Romans, or you know, different uh, our theology, it's that we're engrafted into the branch. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, we have we neglect our heritage, and and like in the past three or four years, uh, three years especially, we've had these fights about statues and mm. names on buildings and all that jazz. Sure. And the reason we do that is because it's our heritage. Right. Now, like, I can go ahead and tell you just by honest truth. I can go past a bridge that says, like, blah, 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 Memorial Bridge. Nobody in that town knows who blah, blah, blah is anymore. Right. I don't know who blah, blah, blah is. Right. And so we do a disservice to our history when we don't know our true heritage. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is the thrust of what um, uh, Reverend Barrios is trying to say mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. is that we have disconnected ourselves with our true spiritual heritage. Sure, right? sure. Now, that being said, that was a long way of saying this. Um, um, I think it's important, too. I was recently having a conversation with my beloved daughter, who is about 20-some-odd years old, mm -hmm. and she was talking about how during 2020 and 2022, people started pontificating things about what, you know, social issues or political issues and then she realized that they just don't have a clue what they're talking about hmm. they were very convicted by it sure but there was no substance behind it sure. so she said she learned to stop following people that could con with such conviction say these things and then just not have a clue what they're saying right and sometimes i think sadly 
that's where we find ourselves as Christian people. Yes. And so yep, yep, this yep. is a call to think about um, the connection we have with the Old Testament, the connection we have with our Jewish people. Yeah. I tell people often when we have conversations about things in the New Testament that you have to you need to understand them, not have to, but you need to understand them in light of things that happen in the Old Testament because it all pulls together. And if you don't understand the culture or the context in which it was placed in the Old Testament, it's hard to make sense of what was trying to be said in the New Testament. Yes. Yeah. And so in my notes preparing for this, I wanted to bring up, which we've done in the past, um, is the tool, and I think I did this in a, lesson uh, a lesson or a thought about types or typology mm-hmm. so in the reformed church because we believe that the that there is a continuation between the covenants that truly it's one covenant of grace not an old covenant of works and a new covenant of grace it's all the covenant of grace um, we we can say we can use typologies and typologies then are things that happen which help us to construct a paradigm to think about what happens in the mm-hmm. New Testament. It's always, it's more than an illustration. I wanted to read this. Um, this is from, I can't remember my internet source on this, but this is not original to me. We should point out the difference between an illustration and a type. A type is always identified as such in the New Testament. So that's another thing. Like right. Something happens in the Old Testament and Paul or Peter or Jesus or somebody says, this was a shadow mm-hmm. of what it was to come or this is the mm-hmm. fulfillment of these things. A Bible student finding correlation between an Old Testament story and the life of Christ is simply finding illustrations, not types. In other words, typology is determined by Scripture. The Holy Spirit inspired the use of types. Illustrations and analogies are the result of human study. So I think that Joseph is a type of Christ, but where it falls short is that Jesus doesn't identify with Joseph. He doesn't, like, point the... Mm-hmm. Um, the story of Joseph to any one thing in particular sure. in Scripture. But sure. I, I don't know. So anyway, mm-hmm. so I say that um, it a type ultimately helps us to think about how to think about Christ or how yeah. to think about the church. Yeah, um, absolutely. Now, the other thing I'll bring up in this introduction is because I think we need to, because there will be people sitting in your Sunday school class, whether they'll admit it or not, um, and they might that just don't think the story of Jonah is historically accurate in the sense of sure. somebody didn't get swallowed by a fish and sit in the belly of a whale um, for three days. Three days and three nights. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, whatever. I choose I choose to believe Scripture default, mm-hmm. um, and the historicity of it. Um, I don't see anything in the story of Jonah that says this should be taken uh, spiritually or whatnot. I think there are some stories in the Bible that Christians take um, literally that I think the Bible indicates it should be spiritual, but nonetheless, right. I don't see it as one. So right. my attitude on this is, is I'm going to take the historicity of it, and then I'm also going to take the spiritual imagery of it. Mm-hmm. That way I have both, and if the historical part didn't happen, I don't think I've been cheated right. um, at all. Okay. So that's where I'm at there. Okay. And so the whole, the whole introduction then, uh, we run through... The story of Jonah, just understanding, um, giving us that background, that understanding. I did want to point out that towards the end of that, she says the rabbinic tradition believed that after death, and this is important, that the soul stays on top of the body for three days trying to return itself. So when talking about Lazarus, Jesus calculated his arrival in Bethany on the fourth day after Lazarus' death to prove something. But then returning to the previous thought of death, Effective after the third day, it's important to keep in mind as we look about the study of Jonah versus Christ being in the tomb right. for three days. Christ in the tomb for three days. So yep. just the, the point of that is it's not outside of the Jewish mind. Their their thought of death is different. Yeah. Yes. In the tomb. So anyway. it's one of those one of those cultural understandings that is very important for us to understand what the point of this being in scripture is. So So what causes the um this occasion is that the Pharisees ask for a sign, mm-hmm. which I think rightly irritates Jesus. <laughs> Wouldn't it though? I think so because it? they were just, you know, following around him and they're seeing, you know, all the other stuff see, he's doing. Like the Give lame us another people one. Give us another up, one. Running a marathon. Yeah. 
And then all of a sudden they're like, okay, wait, let's be serious now. Yeah. What's the sign you are who you say you are? Mm-hmm. And so um, I think that um, that irritates Jesus to the extent that he says, I'm, I'm done with your signs. So yep. There's one more sign that I'm going to give you, and it's the sign of Jonah, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I think what Jesus was saying, look, you're an unrepentant people. You're an obstinate people. Um, and I think I'm trying to figure out how this typology works. For me, it's kind of a reverse thing. So Jonah goes into the belly of the whale because he's kind of obstinate, right? He's trying to disobey. Very obstinate. And so he has to sit in the belly of the whale and then get thrown up. And then he's like, okay, I've come to my senses. In true Jesus fashion, Jesus is saying, y'all are obstinate. Y'all are terrible. Y'all won't do what I say. But I will take upon this. Yes. And then when I rise up, what are you going to do? Yeah. Are you going to be, but he knows because then he says. Are you going to be repentant? Yeah, because or? then he says Nineveh is going to rise up against you mm-hmm. and testify against your your uh, your unrighteousness. Yep. So it's weird, though, because the typology isn't one-to-one. I mean, no. Jesus isn't Jonah. And so we need to remember that Jonah's not the type. The belly of the whale or the belly of the fish is the type. Mm-hmm. That as he's in the belly of the whale, so Jesus is in the belly of the earth kind mm-hmm. of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so. I got I got this so like Jonah had been given up to the fish like mm-hmm. he's complete he can't get out of his own whatever he's stuck he's stuck but God brought him through it Jesus yes. then submits himself to the power of the Jews and the Romans and crucifixion Jesus puts himself submits himself to the power of death and then God brings Jesus through that right yeah, yeah. so that might be the type is that it also helps us to understand that there's Jesus is at he's lost complete control. Like yeah. he's in the belly of the whale. He's in the belly of death. Yeah, he's completely <clears throat> submitted where so again it's that reversal because Jonah refused to submit to the will of God. He was put into the belly of the fish. But Jesus completely submitted to the will of God. And was put in the belly of the earth. Yeah. All right. So now the next part in this lesson is a discussion on on the three days and the three nights that Christ mm-hmm. was in uh, the tomb. This is the <clears throat> digging deeper section. Right. Um, was I not there before? No, you're good. All right. We've well. been in digging deeper, but just to clarify. Gotcha. Okay. So um, there. I remember when I was growing up, one of those crazy new atheist people was like. Jesus wasn't in the grave for three days and three nights. Mm. It was like three days, two nights or something, however it was. Um, these are the kind of things that don't really, like, bother me. Sure. Um, I've always just assumed it's something I, difference I don't, in culture. Yeah. Like, but, don't understand entirely. Um, <clears throat> but what I do think is important in here, there, I did a little bit more research to say one of the reasons that there might be a discrepancy on things is the high Sabbath versus the Sabbaths. Yes. Why? Okay, so I wanted to read what I've found here. Um, she brings up a high Sabbath, I believe. Yes, she does. Um, so there's I'm a difference. So you time. have a regular Sabbath every week, obviously. Yep. That's the one. But then there's seven of these um, festivals yep. throughout the year. Feast, if you will. And so... It's about two-thirds of the way down on page 20. It's the paragraph that starts with the next morning is the first day. Right. And then she brings up... The Passover lasts for seven days or a yeah. Sabbath. When a feast day falls on a Sabbath during the week, it's called the High Shabbat. The High Shabbat is an addition to the seminal Shabbat. This day is a day of great solemnity. On that day, you don't work, but rest from all daily activities and devote yourself to the study of Scripture. As soon as night falls, the High Shabbat begins. This is the second night our Savior was in the tomb. So, um, yeah. These high Shabbats, they're called high Shabbats because of a translation in King James. But anyway, um, you have these seven feast days that you can find in the Old Testament. It's the Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, Feast of the Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So each of those days, or if they're seven-day feast or whatever, there is a mm-hmm. day where you do not work. Mm-hmm. Right? And so, um, so depending on how all this, you might have had a, 
high Sabbath day than a Sabbath day, or it could have been a double Sabbath day. I mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I'm not going to get too much too much in the weeds. Um, but what I wanted to bring up was just because I thought it was uh, important. Uh, Christ was crucified on one of these, I, I believe, on one of these high Sabbath days, but it was on the start of the Passover. Mm -hmm. Now, I had read to you, the Passover is one, and the Day of Atonement is another. You can go back, I'm going to trust you to go back and read what each of these feasts did. Mm -hmm. But the Passover, so there's people now in the church that would say, well, Christ was crucified as the Passover, not as an atonement. Sure. Um, but, you know, we've talked about that some. I want to read, there's a guy named Rashi. He was in the Middle Ages. He was a Jew, very well-respected commentator. And he, he writes this. I see the pass. This is, he's not talking about Jesus because he's a Jewish commentator. I see the Paschal blood and, and pro propitiate. Um, I mercifully take pity on you by means of the Paschal blood and the blood of circumcision, and I propitiate your souls. This is what he commented about the Passover. So what he's saying is, is that the Paschal lamb and the Paschal blood works just like the atonement mm. in that your sins are propitiated or, or, or whatnot. And so as Christians... Because it's a sacrificial lamb that was slain to... So to, that death would pass so over. So that death would pass over. Right. So yes, that it, it, whatever it is, either Christ's death as in the atonement or Christ's death as a Passover, because in the New Testament you have Paul talking about the Passover lamb. Right? Yeah. Our, our Passover lamb has been slaughtered, these yep. kinds of things. Yep. The key to it, I think the way we understand it in in the modern church would be, again, I'm going to get an email for this. They had to die. Yeah. Now, whatever that death did, yeah. whatever, in your economy of salvation, but the fact that Christ, our Passover lamb, or when John says, behold, the lamb of God who mm -hmm. takes away the sin of the world. Yeah. Christ had to die in the economy of salvation for some reason, either A, so that we are spared death and we receive eternal life, mm -hmm. or as a propitiation for our sins in which the Lamb of God takes upon those sins so that we live. Correct. Right? Correct. Um, Correct. And again, I'm sure I'll get an email from somebody, but I think biblically speaking, it's hard for me to get around that Christ had to die as part of the economy of salvation. Uh, now, again... From there, I'm not mm -hmm. going to go, but um, I can read the Old Testament. And using types as an interpretive tool, I am trained to see this dead animal as a reason that, mm -hmm. the, that the Israelites are passed over. Correct. So Correct. there's that. Yes. <clears throat> yep. Um, all right. So that's all I'm going to get to in that. Okay. Now, y'all can get in deeper into the... the the hours and the times and the days that Christ was in there. Yeah. Again, when we go through this lesson, I think the point is, is that we show deference to our history, that we understand that everything, especially during that time, that hour, those hours of Christ's death, they had meaning and they, they were purposeful. It wasn't just luck or some uh, blind... Some strange coincidence. That all this happened. Yeah, right? no, definitely not. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm just going to go with the... Um, the reflection questions. So the reflection questions, yes. I'm digging deeper. The Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus for a sign. What do you think your attitude would be when Jesus comes a second time? For the Pharisees, my attitude? I think my attitude would be great. I hope so. I mean, I think I really I hope Jesus. my attitude would be good. Um... And I, and I don't think I don't think I need to ask for a sign that Jesus did certain things. Right. Um, that that I don't. Yeah. So I don't think I would. Okay. So you wouldn't. So the second question is: Would you also ask for a sign, or would you accept it without question? I, I don't know if I do it without question. Yeah. I think I think I'd have to point, you know, <laughs> to <laughs> test the theory. Yeah, I'd have to poke yeah. a little bit. Yeah. I mean, because you know we have. I'm sure, I'm sure, I have no doubt. While we're recording this, you yeah. have this thing about to happen in Israel because of the yeah. Israeli and Hamas. <clears throat> Hamas conflict and all that jazz. And I'm sure 
that we're going to be hearing about the end times and the wars and rumors of wars and all the prophecies and people are, and so it's going to bring up these, these things, these yeah. signs and yep. wonders and all that jazz. Absolutely. Um, so I, I don't know. And I'm not going to believe everything I hear on YouTube. No. So I'm going to poke around a little. Sure. Bit, right. Sure. Uh, but we're also told that, you know, not to put all of our stock in that because nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody right? knows the day or the time. Just be prepared. Um, I'm, I'm wondering though, do you ask for signs in general? Do I ask for, it's, you know, I have, I have kind of done like a Gideon fleece thing where I've asked yeah. for God to. I've got one out know, right now, friends, pray for me. There we go. That I've asked for something to be given to tell me if this is the correct direction to go or whatever. So I, I have. I do yeah. sometimes. Yeah, sometimes I do. So how can you incorporate the feast of God into your studies of the Bible, understanding that they teach us what is to come and thus benefiting from a more complete knowledge of the scriptures. Um, so as a Sunday school teacher, I think here's how you can address that. Because there's going to be people that don't have any clue, desire, mm -hmm. or want to, want to do this. Yeah. And I get that. But think how important Christmas is. Yeah. And the reason why Christmas is important is because it has this religious element. I started this by saying Santa Claus is coming and old boring heads over here decided it's not Santa Claus. It's, it's about Jesus. Santa. Yeah. That's exactly why it's important. Yeah. I mean, that's the exact reason why it's important. And it didn't, and a lot of these, um, the Sabbath, again, we have stopped doing the Sabbath mostly. But even just the regular Sabbath, it was important and it's still important. Mm -hmm. Or when we have Pentecost, it was important. It's still important. Still these, important. These, are the, these are the holidays in which Jesus was training us to think about, or God was thinking, making us think about Jesus or training yes. about Jesus. Yep. I don't Absolutely. think it's about, I like feast. I like, I don't necessarily have to do the Old Testament ones. Um, but I, you should know them. Um, and I think that one of the things we do as Christians is to celebrate the, the feast of the sure. New Testament. And, and again, that sounds Catholic, but Pentecost, Advent, Lent, mm -hmm. Easter, mm -hmm. you know, Christmas. Yeah, I think a lot of times, though, in our culture, we've kind of gotten lost. Trinity Sunday. To the, the secular calendar right. and not the religious calendar. You know, I mean, the religious calendar of the church, which all the, all the things you were just listing are really important for all us Saints to know Day. and understand. Um, but we get caught up in Thanksgiving and Halloween and Easter and, you know, looking at it from a secular perspective, not just the church perspective. Whatever days we get off from work. Yeah, yeah, And, exactly. and so, I, and the other thing, the reason why it's important, I think it's important that we embrace these, these holidays and at least know them, number one, just for our scriptural knowledge. But number two, um, that's how things become concrete in our lives. Yeah, that's how we focus our lives on God and understand the scriptures is because it's it's that continuation, you know. What, uh, who was it that said I have to preach the gospel every Sunday Martin because Luther. Martin Luther, yeah, the, the, because we forget every week. And that's what the church calendar is there to help us do is to constantly remind us of who God is and what God has done in our lives. Really important. So let's learn from the scripture. So the Lord has risen. He has risen indeed. Amen. Amen. She thought she was going to sneak one. <laughs> I was trying. <laughs> so Jesus, um, Jesus is exactly who he says he is, that yeah. he has proven through everything that he has done, um, through all the signs and wonders, that he is exactly who he claims to be, is the Messiah. Yeah. I think the way I can approach this would be, I, I really just answered that reflection question. Mm -hmm. um, when you hear people say, I believe in God or I follow Jesus, but in many cases, a person doesn't know how to answer basic questions about their faith in God and Bible. That's so irritating. Yeah. I mean, like, I get it. Fine. Praise the Lord. Somebody loves Jesus. But, like, put some death behind it. Yeah. Um, that made me think. Have you ever seen the movie Draft Day? Kevin no. Costner. He's, like, the, uh, I don't know, player man, player person. I think I've heard of it. I haven't watched it. Of course it. you have. It's amazing. Okay. Anyway, one of the scenes is he's trying to determine who, like, is going to be the, the, their pick. Oh, for sure. The draft, right? Okay. You know, when you're talking NFL stuff, this is millions of dollars in mm -hmm. the year or whatever. And one of the scenes is, or one of the stories, I don't know if this was true or if it was inspired by something true. Um, they tape a $100 bill at the back of the playbook, you know, because a playbook's pretty important, right? Just because you got the, yeah. you know, if you don't know the playbook, right. you're going to be a terrible you, teammate. Right. You kind of need to know how the rest of the team works. Right. So they tape the $100 at the back of the playbook. And one guy goes in, you know, the hot shot that, you know, best player, everybody yeah. loves on whatever. And they ask, well, did you go through the playbook? Oh, yeah, man, I went through the playbook. But when they got the playbook back, the $100 was still there. Or he never said anything about the $100. Sure. Which... Even if you're about to get a $2 million contract. You're still going to get 100 bucks. Dude, Come thanks on. for that, Benjamin. Anyway, 
Um, and then, then the other guy, there was another guy who was, you know, kind of like your blue collar worker, wasn't going to be number one, but you know, he, um, comes in and he puts the, uh, hundred dollar bill and an envelope with a letter sent to him that says, you keep this hundred dollars, give it to me after my bonus for winning the Super Bowl for you or something. And sure. so it showed. And so anyway, one team gets the guy who's not, you know the hot shot that didn't get the hundred dollars. Right. And then the the person who knows the playbook yeah. gets picked and they, you know, yeah. do whatever. But I think there's something to that. Like yeah. you want somebody that's not just hot shot. That's not just no, but knows knows their scripture. You want another scripture? Understands the story. Yeah, not just says it. So, so. that was low hanging fruit. Thank you, draft day movie. Yeah, illustration. Yeah. So, what strategies can help you study God's word with more commitment? Again, end of now. end of January. Uh, there is oh. a yeah. By the end of January, spiritual practices uh, curriculum will be out and available to you. That's part a, of it. Is uh, there's one two way. two workshops on using the Word of God yeah. as a as you know formation kind of formation, and then one is just scriptural study. And so we need that. Um, but intention. I mean, like yeah. you know, you might not do the whole like wake up at six o'clock in the morning and go through you know seventeen chapters of Leviticus. Fine, but let's be intentional. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I'm encouraging my children to do right now is the proverb a day. Got to get them started somewhere. Yeah. One proverb that's a day. That's a good way to it's start. The first, do Proverbs 1, second. Yeah. Then you end up reading Psalm 31, what, six times a year, seven times a year, yep. whatever. 31. Yep. Paul. All good. So let's apply this scripture, shall we? So believing in the resurrection was a matter of faith. Believing that Jesus died and rose again is the foundation on which we build our faith and trust in God. And this is what the Pharisees weren't doing. Yeah, they didn't believe. Okay, so here's the thing. They didn't believe. So I don't, I've I've gone full circle on this. And this might maybe actually not full circle, but like when I first became a Christian, I thought it was, yes, you have to believe in Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Okay, but the longer I've lived, I'm like, does it take any faith whatsoever to believe an objective truth? Like I object, I think historically speaking, I can objectively say Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It'd be like my favorite sports team. I can read a scoreboard. Mm -hmm. It does me no good to be like, I really believe they won. Well, yeah, they did. Their scoreboard. The scoreboard says so. Where the faith comes in is where the Pharisees didn't want. The Pharisees did not have the faith that Christ was from God. They didn't have the faith that God was working in Christ to reconcile them to him. And I think that's where I think faith comes in, Mm, um, is that did God send Jesus Christ out like am I part of the world that God so loved the world including me yeah um that I trust that I should I, yeah. I see that's where um uh, what faith is for me that that it's effective for me yes and that that I'm included yeah um so there's some humility I think it's the humility to say it's the humility of repentance yeah I like it just Pharisees didn't like to repent so I think no <laughs> I think for, they didn't like to admit that they were wrong. Right. So I think that was it. Wasn't faith necessarily yeah. that this person jumped up from the ground. Some of them knew he did. Sure. But they still wouldn't repent. No. And so that's where faith was. Yeah. It was faith that God desired better for you. I yeah. Guess, absolutely. So this is a great question to like land today and just think about is what can you do to continue to grow in your faith and trust in the perfect will of Jesus in your life? Good discussion, good thought process there on how can you as a group, how can you individually? Yeah. My prayer is that tonight, if you're watching this on Sunday or or whenever you watch it, I'm, I'm hoping you're filled with family. I'm hoping you're filled with good Amen. friends. I'm hoping you're filled with the, the spirit of Christmas. And yeah. so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas, everyone.